Hello, a very good morning and welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Leading Labour figures are lining up to criticise the government after Boris Johnson's resignation as an MP. The deputy leader, Angela Rayner, says it's a never-ending Tory soap opera. Mr Johnson accused those behind the Partygate inquiry of trying to drive him out. Meanwhile, the Privileges Committee has accused the former PM of attacking the integrity of Parliament. Liz Bates reports. And he's off. Boris Johnson, who nine months ago was Prime Minister, has quit as an MP. In a long, angry statement, he blamed the Privileges Committee that investigated him over Partygate. The evidence I shall give for this committee should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. On learning, they wanted to see him suspended for over 10 days, which could have seen him kicked out of the Commons, he stood down, branding it a kangaroo court. He thrives on the oxygen of publicity. So what on earth he'll do next, I do not know. So in some ways, I don't care, but I do actually, because I care passionately about having people involved in politics that are decent and honest and honourable and don't tell lies. And that is not that man, Boris Johnson. It comes amid a standoff with the Cabinet Office over their handling of his Covid communications and his resignation honours list. Added to the controversy with his old ally, Nadine Dorries, denied a peerage, also dramatically standing down just hours earlier. I'd done, um, you know, 18 years as an MP and I did think I'd be retiring in two years, but there's this kind of new life opening up in front of me, along with a granddaughter. And so there are just other priorities and things to do. And I was... I didn't want to cause a by-election, but, but, you know, I've got over myself, frankly. In his statement, he takes aim at the current Prime Minister, his record on Brexit and his party's lack of ambition. And things are about to get worse for Rishi Sunak. With a by-election now on the horizon that could inflict another electoral wound on the Conservatives in his seat of Uxbridge and Ryslip. Probably hate him as a prime minister, but he's quite funny as a person. He's not the best prime minister. Like everything that he's done thus far is just a bit wrong. And I mean, whatever wrong that you do, you gotta face the consequences at the end of the day. There was only so much he could say to get himself out of trouble. And to be honest with you, we needed someone fresh here in Uxbridge. All of this a gift to the opposition. It's a soap opera. What the public want to know about is who is going to look after their interests, who's going to be actually interested in, 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 in the cost of living, in looking after our hospitals, in making sure that we fight crime on our streets. That's what should be important. In the final line of his statement, Mr Johnson says he's going, at least for now. A message reminiscent of his last words in the Commons as Prime Minister. Um, hasta la vista, <laughs> baby. A reminder to his rivals, he may be leaving Parliament, but Boris Johnson's influence on British politics is not going anywhere. Liz Bates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, as we mentioned, Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, is amongst those piling in on the former PM this morning. She said the British public are sick to the back teeth of this never-ending Tory soap opera played out at their expense. After 13 years of Conservative chaos, enough is enough. It's time to turn the page with a fresh start for Britain, with a Labour government focused on people's priorities of tackling the cost of living and building a better future. Well, let's go live to Westminster. Our political correspondent, Rob Powell, is there for us this morning. Hi there, Rob. So what happens next, both procedurally but also for Boris Johnson himself? Yeah, I think in the short term, Anna, there'll be a nervous wait in government this weekend for any evidence of more panic in the party or the contagion spreading, if you like. At the moment, despite rumours of more resignations among Boris Johnson allies, those haven't materialised. Um, allies and friends of his, like the newly ennobled Dame Priti Patel, uh, paying tribute, calling Boris Johnson a titan of politics rather than falling on her sword um, this weekend. Then I think we wait for that full Privileges Committee report to come out, potentially in the first part of next Next week, the Privileges Committee released a punchy statement last night accusing Boris Johnson of impugning the integrity of the House. They said they'll meet on Monday and conclude the inquiry and publish shortly after that. Ever the journalist, Boris Johnson has tried to write the first draft of history um, in his resignation letter yesterday. We wait to read that report for ourselves. Then there are the by-elections. Boris Johnson's old constituency in West London clearly at risk. Nadine Dorries potentially um, at risk 
um, her constituency potentially at risk as well. In the longer term, it then depends on what Boris Johnson decides to do. Does he um, decide on trying to stand again in another seat? I think there are problems there. Does Rishi Sunak and Tory HQ allow that? Uh, is he able to, given that the standards and the privileges committee report will still be hanging over his head? I think if he does stay on the outside, actually, this could prove positive for Rishi Sunak in the longer term, as it could stem the flow of drama uh, and finally banish the ghost of his predecessor. Yes, an interesting one to watch um, and a busy week. Rob, thanks very much indeed. Well, coming up, I'll be speaking to Boris Johnson's former press secretary, Will Walden. That's coming up at around half past seven. And then at ten past eight, the Conservative peer and pollster Lord Hayward will give his take on what the former PM's resignation could mean for the Tories at the next general election. And then at ten past nine, we'll hear the thoughts of the former Tory Justice Secretary, David Gorg. So plenty of reaction uh, throughout the programme this morning. But now for an incredible story of survival from the heart of the Colombian jungle. Four children have been found alive in the Amazon, ending a five-week search that gripped the country after their plane crashed. Three adults died when the plane went down due to engine failure. The four children, aged 13, 9, 4 and 11 months, survived the impact. Well, they were rescued close to the crash site after spending 40 days alone in the jungle. Rescuers had previously found discarded fruit that the children ate to survive, as well as improvised shelters made with vegetation. Colombia's president, Gustavo Petro, predicted their story would go down in history. The first news is that, indeed, the indigenous communities participating in the search, along with the Colombian military, have found the four children after 40 days. They were alone. It was them who achieved a great exemplary survival. It will become history. These children are today the children of peace and the children of Colombia. The details of the 37 federal criminal charges facing former US President Donald Trump have been made public. As that unravelled, we spotted the former president playing golf. Our US correspondent, Mark Stone, reports. Spotted by Sky News on his golf course, Donald Trump teeing off just an hour before the extraordinary indictment against him was unsealed for all to see. 37 felony counts, federal charges, laid out over 49 pages. And with photographs, the boxes containing the top secret documents at the heart of all this. Found at Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort, in a bathroom, in a storeroom, in a ballroom. Now we know what they related to. The classified documents Trump stored in his boxes included information regarding defence and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries, United States nuclear programmes, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to foreign attack. We can see the case for obstruction. Mr Trump is alleged to have told his attorney to inform the FBI that he did not have documents. It alleges there was the moving of documents to conceal them. And Mr Trump is alleged to have suggested to his attorney that he hide or destroy documents. Then details of a recording between Trump and a publisher. Trump showed and described a plan of attack that Trump said was prepared for him by the Department of Defence and a senior military official. Trump told the individuals that the plan was highly confidential and secret. Trump also said, as president, I could have declassified it. And now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. That last point is alleged to have taken place here at his New Jersey golf course in July 2021, months after he had lost the presidency. And crucially, it appears to contradict his defence that he had somehow declassified the documents. It appears to prove that he knew he had retained secret documents. Jack Smith is the independent special counsel in this case. He tasked a grand jury of ordinary Americans to examine the evidence. They concluded there is a case for Mr. Trump to answer. Our laws that protect national defense information are critical to the safety and security of the United States, and they must be enforced. Violations of those laws put our country at risk. Mr. Trump's defense, for now, is deflection. A boxer's hoax, just like the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, and all of the others. This has been going on for seven years. They can't stop. 
because it's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. This will test America politically, legally, socially. Remember, he is far and away the favorite to be the Republican candidate for the presidency. His supporters and many in his party, too, seem to be locking in behind him against what they believe is a conspiracy to bring him down. Mark Stone, Sky News in New Jersey. Now, parts of England could get hotter than Ibiza today, with the Met Office warning that we could see temperatures of up to 30 degrees. Well, our correspondent Aisha Zahi joins us now from the Thames Lido in Reading. Um, morning to you. It's going to get really hot and a, and a challenge for some people to, to keep cool and safe. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The scene behind me might be a bit deceiving. It's quite quiet here, but no doubt it's going to pick up here. Parks, beaches, all expected to be busy across England today. It's expected to reach about 31 degrees across central and southern parts of England, and it's led to this amber heat health alert issued by the UK Health Security Agency. Now, to be really clear here, the message isn't to stay cooped up indoors. Uh, by all means, uh, people should go outside and enjoy the sunshine as much as they want to, but this health alert has been put into place to remind people to do so responsibly. So, uh, so what it means is that there is a danger of this heat to people of all ages, uh, and uh, of all ages, which means that the NHS could face some strain as a consequence. But um, the message they're really putting out is for people to stay hydrated, to make sure they're checking in on friends and family as they normally would, but especially those who are elderly or more vulnerable. People with lung conditions like asthma in these kind of wet, this kind of weather are more vulnerable. It exacerbates those symptoms. So uh, really messages to people to enjoy the sunshine, but stay safe whilst doing so. Aisha, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's get more on that warning with Sky meteorologist uh, Joe Wheeler. And Joe, tell us just how hot is it likely to get and what's behind this hot weather? <laughs> Well, we're looking at temperatures up to around 30, 31 degrees Celsius, and that zone most likely to see those high temperatures is really London up to Manchester and uh, and then back down towards the, the southeast part of Wales as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of heat around. Now, of course, we've had high pressure over us for quite a long time, and western parts of the country have seen some lovely sunshine. Um, parts of Wales have seen high temperatures for the past two weeks or so. But here on the east coast, it has been so cold, I can't tell you. Literally, daytime temperatures 11 or 12 degrees Celsius and this is down to an easterly drift which has brought low cloud in over the coast and bringing it inland overnight and then it's not burning back through the day so this is virtually the first time we've seen sunshine at all and of course temperatures will respond in kind and we could see temperatures here today 10 degrees higher than we've seen over the past couple of weeks uh, of course there is a heat alert out today that's for the high temperatures but also a thunderstorm warning and where you catch one of those it could be potent torrential rain gusty winds and even some hail okay joe thanks very much indeed um so another hot day on the card let's get a look at the rest of the weekend's forecast then Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. So that very warm air is moving up from the south this weekend, but it comes with a risk of thunderstorms. There may be a few sharp showers in parts of Ireland and southwest Britain first thing, but for most it'll be a dry start if rather cloudy towards North Sea coasts. Overnight cloud will slowly burn back to the coast to leave plenty of sunshine and very high UV levels. It'll turn increasingly hot and humid, triggering some heavy and thundery showers with hail and and lightning. Northeastern coast will be breezier and cooler where the low cloud lingers. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, the UN aid chief is warning that a staggering 700,000 people in Ukraine's Kherson region are without access to clean drinking water after the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam. Well, the UN aid chief uh, warns of that uh, huge number uh, facing those challenges uh, without fresh water. Um, meanwhile, um, Kiev and Moscow have traded blame for the explosion that sent 18 cubic kilometres of water flooding across the region. The contaminated water is also sparking fears of cholera, heaping misery on an area already scarred by war. The figures uh, are already terrifying. We're talking about 700,000 people without proper drinking water. 
That's an extraordinary number. The truth of this is that this is only the beginning of seeing the consequences of this act. And the consequences are going to be a ravaged breadbasket, as you know, in that southern part of Ukraine. And that leads on to international consequences. Well, that warning came as President Putin repeated claims that a Ukrainian counteroffensive has begun, an operation he says so far has failed to inflict any real damage. First of all, we can clearly say that the offensive has started, as indicated by the use of strategic reserves by the Ukrainian army. That's the first thing. Secondly, the Ukrainian troops haven't achieved their stated tasks in a single area of fighting. This is absolutely obvious. Well, for more on all this, I'm joined by our military analyst, Sean Bell. Nice to yeah. see you, Sean. Morning to you. Um, so, first of all, this warning from the UN aid chief about the number, a huge number of people affected uh, by not being able to get access to fresh water, potentially, after this um, destruction of this key dam. Yeah, it's, it's huge numbers. I mean, the environmental impacts, the impact on people, the sewerage, everything, there's huge amounts. And it's worth remembering that this dam wasn't just there for show. It wasn't just there to provide a road, provided fresh drink, drinking water for a whole load of people. There was a hydroelectric dam which provided huge amounts of power. Um, and also it provided the cooling water for the Zaporizhia nuclear facility. Now, we pretty confident that's not going to be a problem. Um, but as you say, the, the long-term impact of this dam blowing... I think what's interesting, though, I, I, you'll excuse me, but from a military perspective, yeah. you know, clearly there's a horrible... There's several people have died as a result of the dam blowing. But actually, it's really interesting because the immediate impact on the war is more that suddenly Russia protects a flank, that you can't do an amphibious assault across the Dnieper because it's all flooded, and that <laughs> reduces the front line that Russia has to worry about. And it also gives a bit of carnage for Ukraine to distract them from their main effort. But actually, it's uh, the dam. If the Russians had blown the dam when the Ukrainians had been doing uh, an amphibious approach, that could have been devastating. And also, so one of the reasons that the, the Ukrainians would have been worried about it, because they'd have been worried that Russia might have blown that. Now they've blown it, the waters will recede. I understand, actually, the dam waters are already starting to fall, and therefore the, the flood waters will recede. And when they do, when the summer months there's less rain falls, all of a sudden, the Dnipro will once again be fordable. They will be able to do attacks across it without the threat of the Russians blowing the dam. So, in a way, um, Ukraine will have known this dam was, was uh, set with demolition charges to blow. They will therefore have planned accordingly. Now Russia has blown it, that takes that card off the table. So it will be interesting in the weeks and, and months ahead. That, once again, will make life a little bit more difficult for Russia in the long term than it does in the near term. And we've been talking for weeks about a, a spring offensive by um, Ukraine. President Putin is now saying that counteroffensive has begun already. Is, is he right in that analysis? Well, every time we comment on President Putin, we always take a large dollop of salt with it. Um, the very fact, if you look at the context of why he said it has started, he said, because the Russian defences have been so robust, we've inflicted dreadful casualties, and, in other words, it was sort of a victorious uh, sense. The harsh reality of it is that we've been waiting for this spring offensive for some time. Um, we all expect a sort of fanfare of trumpets as everybody rushes across the start line. There's normally th a couple of phases beforehand. The first one is you prepare by targeting the rear of your enemy, the logistics chain, the, the railway intersections. We've seen that been happening over the last few weeks. The next phase is you do all on the front. You probe defences <clears throat> to see where the Russian defences are weakest and where you... And then you capitalise with the momentum. We've not seen the major thrust yet of the Ukrainian forces. And it's worth pointing out, President Zelensky said, um, you'll know when our counteroffensive has started because Russia will feel it. I don't think Russia's feeling it yet, and I think these are the opening overtures that we're seeing. Um, there has been some reports of Western tanks being destroyed, um, much of which this limited detail, because Ukraine are not talking about it at all at the moment, but I'm, I suspect we're going to hear more and more about it over the coming days, but we're going to be really cautious about reading too much in to the odd sound bites we're getting out at the moment. Well, absolutely, because you, you have to remember it's an information war as well. Absolutely and right. Ukraine won't want to give away any of its secrets, will it? No, a, not of its sure. strategy. But there is a challenge for Russia, isn't there, in where they put their troops, because they don't know where Ukraine might strike. Exactly right. And what Russia will be holding is some forces in reserves and waiting to see if the uh, Ukraine's make any breakthrough and plug in the gaps. I think this, what's fascinating, though, from a military perspective, and again, you'll excuse me looking at this from a purely military perspective, um, Russia will 
Russell is a superpower. And we are, in the West, we've given lots of equipment and aid to Ukraine, and we're sort of hoping that Ukraine will roll back Russia, there'll be a huge victory. That might happen. But we also have to remember that Russia's had weeks, indeed months, to prepare its defences. It's got huge resources available to it. And it is possible that Russia will actually stem the tide and Ukraine will suffer three times the casualties in offence that the Russians do on defence. This could end up with Ukraine getting a bloody nose. And in the worst case, the Russians could roll them back. And that would have devastating consequences for the future of the war, President Zelensky and the West's support. These things hang on a knife edge. It'll be really... I think we've got to be really careful not to just expect the Russians to be rolled back, to be rolled back. We hope that's what'll happen, but it'll be very fraught. And I, no doubt Zelensky is uh, not sleeping well at night at the moment. No, and it could go on for a very long time. Absolutely right. It? Yeah. Sean, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, a Florida researcher who broke the record for the longest stretch a human has spent living underwater has resurfaced after 100 days. Diving explorer and medical researcher Dr Joseph Dituri, known online as Dr Deep Sea, spent over three months living nine metres underwater in the Jules Undersea Lodge in Key Largo in Florida. His mission combines medical and ocean research to study how the human body responds to long-term exposure, exposure to extreme pressure. Let's get more reaction now to Boris Johnson's resignation and what it can mean for his political future. Joining me now is the former press secretary to Boris Johnson, Will Walden. A very good morning to you. Thanks so much for talking to us. Um, morning, you've Alan. worked very closely with Boris Johnson. What do you make of his resignation and the way in which he's done it? Oh, I, it's not in the least bit surprising to me. I mean, Boris Johnson cares about one thing, and that's winning, uh, or at least not losing. And he, and he hasn't lost an election since being rejected by the voters of Cluid South back in 1997. And I think the thing for Boris was that clearly this report threatened to change all that. He's clearly seen the writing on the wall, and presumably a lengthy common suspension was coming his way. That would mean a by-election in his marginal constituency and probably defeat in that election. And, and Boris Johnson won't let that stand. That's the primary motivation here, protecting his version of the narrative. Uh, and by going as he has, all guns blazing, he's able to avoid defeat and blame pretty much everyone else for his demise, the committee, Sue Gray, Rishi Sunak, and frankly, from the statement, anyone seemingly who voted Remain in 2016. Uh, but yet, breathtaking as the statement is, it's also so Boris, and in many ways, it's not the least bit surprising. He told the committee if they found him guilty, he wouldn't respect the outcome. And, and there we go. So it's proved. His narrative for the last year has been, I've done nothing wrong. You know, his two speeches when he left office, one when he resigned, one when he finally went, they tell you all you need to know. And it's been repeated in the statement yesterday. It's all about, it's not me, Gov, it's someone else. And that's all very deliberate. I think what's happened here is that by resigning, he's forever able to say, I delivered Brexit, I won a huge majority. Majority, and yet those pesky Tory MPs did me over and now some biased committee has pushed me out all to stop Brexit. Now that is largely hokum, but there it is. It's very Boris. Well, yes, and his criticism is extreme, isn't it, of the committee. As you say, he's, he repeats that he's done nothing wrong. He talks about the re committee's report being riddled with inaccuracy, reeking of uh, prejudice. Uh, he talks about an absurd and unjust process. He talks about a political hit job, a witch hunt, a kangaroo court, all of that in the same statement. Are you surprised, then, that with that kind of fight behind him, that he's not standing up to defend himself in front of MPs or potentially at a by-election? He's, no. he's not fighting on. N not, not in the slightest, because he, he knows he's probably going to lose. And as I said, he, he, he doesn't do lose. Uh, and what's, I think what's extraordinary about the statement, it, none of this, as I say, is a surprise, but the statement itself is a new level of kind of Borisism uh, in that sense. So, you know, he's clearly angry and he's convinced of his own truth and his own righteousness. There's no apology, no taking responsibility. And it is very Trumpian. And what's interesting is Boris hates the comparisons with Trump, but it is the language of vendetta. It's a long round. And, you know, frankly, it's deeply misleading in places, but it, it, it's very Boris. And he knows all this. He knows a lot of what he's saying is, is, is not true. But I think that there's also a large part of him that actually believes he really has been hard done by. And in part, I think that's because, of you know, if he didn't, the facade of all this would crumble. But I think in part, it's because I suspect all those around him are pulling in the same direction as him and saying the same things to him. I, I think for me, the sad thing this morning is that I don't really recognise 
recognise that person compared to the Johnson that I work for. You know, I think he is a different person. There's a there's a bitterness, there's a pettiness, there's no sense of proportion. Um, you know, it's just not him. You know, when I worked for him at City Hall, you know, he was always the first to laugh at himself. He could be self-deprecating. He did listen, but but he's changed. And thinking about this, Hannah, this morning, I'll give you one quick example. Famously, he wrote two opposing columns ahead of the Brexit referendum, and everyone accused him of opportunism then. But actually, that was the thoughtful Boris, you know, balancing the arguments in his own head. I think it would be impossible to think of him having that political antenna now. Instead, it seems to me he sees things only through the prism of sort of anger and hurt and unfairness. And and, and for me, as someone that knew him well and counted him as a friend for many years, I think that's sad. I think that's tragic. But I think it's also quite dangerous. And the Privileges Committee seems pretty angry themselves. They've issued a statement saying that Boris Johnson has impugned the integrity of the House by this statement. That's quite strong stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I mean, it's not surprising because, you know, he certainly impugned them in his in his response um, and they will presumably move very quickly to deal with this and publish the full report and present their evidence. And then there'll be those that hate Johnson who will say, told you so, and those who love him will say, what a load of old, old rubbish. But I think what's important is if he was thinking about some sort of political comeback, particularly now, and there are clearly some in the Tory party who are worried about the possibility of him standing down now but seeking a safe a safe seat in a by election or ahead of the next you know ahead of the next election, I, I think that's not going to happen. But but clearly you know the committee will have seen the way he's responded, and 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 they will perhaps want to you know go even further. Um, you know given that he's responded in the way he has to the report, maybe there'll be further sanction as a result of this. So he he has upped the stakes massively. But on the other hand, what what's he got to lose in that regard? If they were going to publish this any. Anyway, he's got the first strike in. He's tried to take control of the steering wheel of the car, um, regardless of where it's going to end up crashing. So you don't think he'll make a comeback and try and stand again, certainly in the short term, but how much damage can he do from the sidelines? I mean, the statement is full of digs at Rishi Sunak and his government, isn't it? Will he carry on with those kind of attacks, do you think? And will they, will they strike home? Uh, he'll certainly carry on with them, I, I suspect. I, I suspect there's number 10 and quite a few Tory MPs will be hoping that without an elected platform, he'll kind of wander aimlessly into the wilderness eventually. I think that's a big hope and I don't think it'll materialise. I think it's worth remembering, only a few weeks ago, he was being written off again. The local election results didn't kill off Sunak. His insurgency over the Windsor framework, the Northern Ireland Protocol, withered on the vine. He cut a lonely figure and you know, very few people followed him into the dissenting lobby. And yet, in one fell swoop last night, he's managed to breathe new life into himself, into Boris Johnson. Uh, and I think, look, I, I can't see a parliamentary or political return in the short term, and, and probably not ever. But be in no doubt, Johnson is on the warpath. He remains a powerful communicator. He is his own best megaphone. You know, he has one song to play, and that was I Was Robbed. But more importantly, he's free to say now what he likes, when he likes, without consequence or accountability. And just one final thing, Anna. He's very good at this. You know, he's at his best when he's an Surgeon, you know, he was famous for lobbing rocks across the Thames when he was mayor at Cameron and Osborne. He will now, I expect, do exactly the same with Rishi Sunak. Only, sort of, rather than rocks, he appears prepared to sort of lob the political equivalent of live ordinance. And I think where that ends is anybody's guess. Okay, well, no doubt we will be talking about it again in future. Then, uh, Will Warden, fascinating to get your insights. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks, Anna. Take care. So time to have another look through the papers this morning. Here with me to review them are the journalist and author Yasmin Alibi-Brown and CEO of international marketing partners Alison Stewart-Allen. So welcome back to both of you. Uh, we dealt with um, a lot of the front pages in the last hour, dominated, of course, by Boris Johnson's resignation. But uh, we're delving a little bit deeper now. And... Um, Yasmin, you've picked out a story that I think is actually on the front page, is it? No, it's not on the front page. Anyway, it's focusing on the, um, the resignation... Uh, honours of Boris Johnson that would all otherwise probably have made the front pages uh, today. Um, this is in The Guardian, their take on that list that emerged yesterday afternoon. Uh, it's really important, this, because he's not the first and he won't be the last to use the honour system in ways that really aren't acceptable in a real working democracy, handing uh, honours to pals, to found, uh, funders, it's been going on a long time. 
But he has taken it to another level. If you look at the list, you know, the, a lot of the people who were uh, involved in the Partygate scandal, um, I remember the Bring Your Own Bottle party with uh, Martin Reynolds. He gets um, some sir or something. Um, then there's Pretty Patel, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg. And it, you know, the Lords is not a private members club for the powerful, for a, a prime minister in power. And that's how he's used it. Sean Bailey, who failed to win the mayoral, London mayoral election, and we saw a photo of him and about 20 people partying during lockdown. So it's a pretty abysmal and shocking list, I have to say, even for a system which, in my view, is very corrupt. OK, uh, and uh, there will no doubt be lots of discussions still about um, some of those um, honours. But as you say, and there's discussion quite often when, when these resignation honours do come out, whoever the leader is. Um, Alison, take us to the Telegraph, page seven. Um, a lot of focus in recent weeks on AI. There seems yeah. to be growing concern about it. Yep. Um, and this focuses on, on whether or not regulation can keep up. Absolutely. And this is typically the case, you know, as industries evolve, uh, legislation and legislators are behind the curve, uh, mostly because of the machination of lawmaking. Uh, it takes a while to get laws formulated and approved and passed and implemented. Uh, so uh, Tom Tugendhat, who is the security minister, was addressing a conference uh, in the last couple of days and was talking about a culture change is needed uh, to be able to deal with uh, advancing technology and deal with it really quickly. Uh, the challenge, however, is the window within which you have to deal with this advanced uh, technology is very, very short indeed. Now, he's suggesting we have two years. Uh, I think, and all the experts who have been talking about AI, think that it's much less than two years. Uh, you know, recently we had um, major resignations from Google, uh, and from other leading tech firms, uh, these experts have been working on AI and they have resigned uh, as a message, as a signal to say, if we don't regulate this, if we don't control this, we are potentially uh, ending our own survival as a species on this planet, which sounds melodramatic, but it's, it's actually very likely that, you know, human, uh, many human deaths will result because of unchecked AI and how it's applied. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge for British Parliament is they better do something quickly, but they can't. They don't work quickly. That's that's the challenge. I know, a challenge of governments around the world, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it, as well? Um, uh, Yasmin, take us back to, to politics um, inside the eye this time. And um, this focuses on reactions. Um, I think, is it just in the party? Certainly political reactions to Boris Johnson's resignation. And, and so what's the eye telling us about how it has gone down? Well, as ever, he's dividing the nation. There are those who love him and support him, and some of them um, have also been honoured for their loyalty, um, and others who say good riddance. And it's it, he is a Marmite character. Though I'm, I must say, at this point, when we know so much more, uh, because it's been investigated, that there are still people out there, you know, standing up for him. In, in the political circles, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Priti Patel, um, Michael Fabric and um, obviously Nadine Doris, who's leaving, um, they think that they kind of this was um, he was uh, uh, he had a golden touch, and uh, his you know that people have been horrible to him. But I remember reading some time ago his school teacher in a report said, "This boy does not." like taking responsibility or understand the consequences of his actions or something like that. And I think that little boy is still there. He really is okay. aggrieved that anybody decided to check up on him.